Fighting is in our DNA as a species. Mankind has engaged in conflict since time immemorial. While it is a darker aspect of our nature, society, as it's shaped today, owes its existence to this. There is a thrill that we derive from combat that nothing in this world can replicate. As we've moved towards a more civilized age, so have the ways in which we partake and consume conflict, which have evolved to reflect this. This is why, from the ancient gladiatorial pits of Rome to the mixed martial arts octagon of the UFC, we've learned to evolve combat into a form of entertainment where it's no longer frowned upon to enjoy it. The thrill of watching two combatants at the peak of their power put forth all their years of training for that one moment where one of them comes out the victor speaks to a primal instinct within all of us. This is why we treat the likes of Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, Conor McGregor, and Khabib Nurmagomedov as celebrities and iconic warriors of our time. We look for this even in the media we consume today. Live broadcasts of these events aside, plenty of movies and shows over the years have been based on these martial tournaments and conflicts, from movies like Jean-Claude Van Damme's Bloodsport to Tom Hardy's Warrior. These movies have managed to captivate audiences young and old across the globe. It's therefore no surprise that even anime and manga aren't strangers to this form of content. Almost every major shonen anime or manga features a tournament arc. From Naruto's Chunin Exams to Yu Yu Hakusho's Dark Tournament Saga, these have been a staple feature of combat animes. Over the years, Baki by Keisuke Itagaki has dominated the martial arts genre in anime and manga, being the only anime worth mentioning that's solely dedicated to a tournament-style martial arts show. In recent years, with the release of shows like The Records of Ragnarok and Kengen Ashura and their positive reception, we've come to understand that there is still massive potential in this genre. The focus of our video today is the second season of Kengen Ashura, particularly its ending, as the sequel for the show has just dropped on Netflix. Kengen Ashura is a manga series written by Yabako Sandrovich, and it was published from April 2012 to August 2019. A sequel would soon follow in January 2019 titled Kengen Omega, which is still ongoing. Netflix would end up giving it an anime adaptation, with the first 12 parts of the season airing in July 2019, and the second part airing later that year in October, adding another 12 episodes. The first part of the second season airs in September 2023, with the second part having just been released recently. The show draws a lot of comparisons to Baki as they're both tournament-style anime featuring a variety of fighters with different styles. The martial arts on display and the feats these fighters achieve, although primarily grounded in reality, usually push the boundaries of logic and incredulity. It follows the story of Tokita Oma and his caretaker, Kazuo Yamashita, as they navigate the dangerous world of underground fighting where the stakes are higher than you could ever imagine. Ever since the Edo period of Japan, the movers and shakers of this world have hired gladiators and warriors to fight on their behalf in the aforementioned tournaments called the Kengen Matches. While these men place ludicrous bets like chump change on the outcome of these matches, they're all vying for the position of the Kengen Association Chairman. The position holds immense power and prestige as it places that individual at the top of an organization whose members are the wealthiest businessmen and politicians in the world. As the tournament unfolds, Oma must fight with everything, not just for himself, but for Kazuo as well. With the next 12 episodes of the second season having been just released on Netflix, we thought this would be the perfect time to refresh everyone's memories, including our own, before we dive right in. So whether you're already a fan or someone looking to get into the testosterone-fueled world of Kengen Ashura, we got you covered. Besides the power politics that form the backdrop of this show, we know that these new episodes will have the trademark high-octane fights that have turned this anime slash manga into a global franchise. We've gotten you some front row tickets for the next set of matches, so without further ado, let's get right into it. Episode 1, Omen. This episode kicks off where part 2 of the first season lets off. It begins with a flashback of the announcement of the Kengen Annihilation Tournament and gives the audience a quick flashback montage of notable moments from the previous season. We are then shown Oma and Kazuo celebrating their hard-fought victory against the Ryan from the Kure clan in the final episode of last season. Kazuo especially is extremely emotional before Oma reminds him that they're just getting started, and it is, in reality, only the second round of the tournament. Just then, Akiyama Kaede, who has been working as Kazuo's secretary in the shell company, Yamashita Trading Co., comes over and chides Oma for being so reckless and not caring enough for his own well-being before insisting on him visiting the doctor. Akiyama also reminds Kazuo about his meeting with the head of the Kure clan. The scene then shifts to Setsuna Kiryu, the seemingly psychotic nemesis of Oma, who 
looks into the arena as if captivated by what he had just witnessed during Oma's fight. Setsuna is clearly losing his grip even further as he likens Oma to an omnipotent god and curses his fate for losing our protagonist to Nico. It's quite evident in this scene that his obsession with Oma has escalated to another level. We are next shown Kazuo lying on the bar drunk alongside Oma, who's still recovering from his injuries. Mere moments later, overwhelmed by fatigue and injury, Oma falls to the ground and passes out. We get to see a bunch of flashbacks where Nico rescues a young Oma from Mafia members as a child. He explains to Yoma his philosophy on violence and how violence could only be stopped with more violence. He encourages Oma to find his own martial arts or inner tactics as they are known in this universe after explaining their concept to him. As Oma is overcome by rage, he opposes everything being told to him, but a new voice creeps in which is shown to be that of the adult Oma, who agrees with everything his master just told him. As the dream sequence ends, Oma finds himself in an emergency room where the doctor tells him how Oma is able to control his heart and convert that into energy. He also explains the heavy toll that Oma's technique, life advancement, exacts on his body. The doctor ultimately suggests Oma stop fighting if he wants to live. The episode ends with the introduction of Wakatsuki Takeshi, aka the Wild Tiger's second round bout against against the extremely roided up German fighter Julius Reinhold. This episode mostly sets the tone for the rest of the season and ties up some loose ends from the previous. There are no major plot points explored here other than Setsuna's continued obsession with Oma and the latter's interaction with his former master, Nico. Episode 2, Blast Core. The episode begins with a flashback from 33 years ago. Sanpei takes Furumi Heihachi around where he meets a young boy with superhuman strength thanks to his condition, which gives him abnormally high muscle density. Fascinated, Furumi asks the boy to punch him in the guts with all his strength. While the boy hesitates initially, he eventually complies and sends Furumi flying across the room. Due to this incident, Furumi would be hospitalized for four months. Furumi eventually takes the boy under his wing and later becomes the CEO of Furum Pharma, backing the boy, who is revealed to be Wakatsuki Takeshi, the Kengen fights. The episode is mainly about Takeshi and Julius's battle, with the audience and spectating fighters not being able to tell who would come out as the victor. Over the course of the fight, the tides ebb and flow between both fighters as each of them takes turns gaining advantage over the other. As the fight wears on, it becomes evident that both of them are pretty evenly matched in strength. After Takeshi reveals his ace in the hole called Blast Core, the match seems to be finally turning in his favor. However, Julius, through the sheer use of his brute force, powers through and begins pummeling Takeshi. Having used Blast Core multiple times in the fight already, its effectiveness begins to wear off. Even as Takeshi begins to lose consciousness after being grabbed by the head and dragged alongside the arena wall, he has a vision of his past. This inspires him to get back on his feet and unleash a barrage of strikes along with the Blast Core against Julius, followed by a vicious kick to Julius' head that knocks the German fighter out cold. The episode focuses mainly on the development of Takeshi's character despite his role as a side character. Most of this episode is also centered around his fight with Julius and the revelation of his technique, Blast Core. Takeshi himself notes his disappointment that the rest of the fighters now knew about his secret technique, leaving him struggling to find a way to make it work against them. Episode 3, The Clown. This episode starts with the crowd roaring in anticipation as Haruo tells Sekibayashi that they might be running late for the match. Sekibayashi tells Haruo that it was all part of the act and that a slight delay can heighten the anticipation and energy of the crowd. Sayaka then introduces us to Mutaba Gazenga, the infamous blind mercenary from the Congo. We're given a brief flashback to how he and Tomari first made their acquaintance. He is seen destroying a group of pirates single-handedly. The scene then shifts to Jerry announcing Sekibayashi's entrance, highlighting his achievement and strengths as a pro wrestler, when he is suddenly interrupted by Sayaka, who announces that there has been a change to Mutaba's opponent. The new fighter would be someone called Marvelous Seki, who was in fact none other than Sekibayashi's in-ring persona. The two proceeded to immediately duke it out against each other. An immediate clash of styles ensues as Mutaba tries to incapacitate Seki using precision strikes against the latter's pro wrestling influence techniques. The episode ends with Seki seemingly having the upper hand when he permanently damages Mutaba's ears and disorients him by plunging his fingers into the African fighter's ears. Things don't seem to be over, however, as the fight is set to continue in the next episode. This episode showcases an intense and unpredictable battle, which is a highlight of the Kengen shows. With this fight, after the Takeshi and Julius fight, the audience is made to feel that we are well and truly in for another season of high adrenaline blood sport. The introduction of Marvelous Seki serves to subvert the audience's expectations and provides some small comic relief. 
Episode 4, Dignity. The fourth episode starts off exactly where the last left off, with both fighters exchanging brutal blows with each other. Mutaba, already blind and now having lost his hearing and being severely disoriented, gets subjected to a massive one-sided beatdown by Seki. This, however, all turns out to be a ruse, because when Seki, having become overconfident, lunges to finish off the blind fighter, Mutaba returns the favor by destroying Seki's ears as well. He then faints by appearing to go for an eye gouge, but instead delivers a deadly strike to Seki's heart. As Mutaba turns away from his opponent, confident that victory was assured, Seki rises up once again. We get a flashback of Seki Bayashi from his earlier days and his training with his master. It shows us how pro wrestling had changed Seki Bayashi's life and the deep bond between him and his teacher forged through countless years of brutal training. Though Seki goes on to put up a fight momentarily, Mutaba and the audience finally realize that the pro wrestler was fighting purely out of pride and instinct and the fight was already long over. Mutaba then ends the fight with a three count to honor the wrestler's pride. In the training room, Mutaba confides with Tomari that, having lost his hearing, he relied on his sense of smell to fight Seki. He overlooks Tomari, bickering with him about not finishing the fight sooner using the heart strikes, knowing that she would now have influence over Gandhi. This sequence ends with the introduction of Yoru Izuka Saw Ping, a boisterous and excitable fighter, along with his opponent, Mikazuchi Rei, the fighter known as the Lightning God. This episode sees the conclusion of an epic battle, and even though we do get a fleshed out backstory for Seki and connect with him, his ending is a bit abrupt for a character that was hyped up for quite a while. We find out that there is more to Mutaba than his moniker, the Genocider, as he is shown to be an honorable fighter who isn't shy about showing his appreciation and respect for his opponents. The audience is left with the anticipated clash between Sa Ping and Rei for the next episode. Episode 5, Suicide Attack. This episode begins with anticipation being built around the participants of the next fight. We find out that Rei is a former assassin who quit his ways after falling in love with Reno. He is, however, in the Kengen tournament after he requests she allow him to join in order to practice his lightning spirit style. The announcers then go on to hype up Saw Ping and his family's prowess and legacy within the Kengen tournament. We find out that Saw's village is under enormous debt and he's actually fighting to save his village's existence. Right off the bat, we see Rei go on the offensive, using techniques that strike with his trademark speed, which almost catches Saw Ping off guard. After that, he proceeds to use a technique called the Illusory Step from the School of Martial Arts, making it impossible for Saw to keep proper track of him. Ray then begins to use his superior speed and punishes Saw with lightning fast strikes. He is astounded by the Burmese fighter's toughness, having taken several of his strikes head on. Just as the match looks to be overwhelmingly in Ray's favor, he dodges a series of blows and unleashes his own technique called the Burmese Iron Hammer Headbutt, which Ray is barely able to dodge. Ray realizes that if he hadn't been able to dodge that technique, the match would have been instantly over. We are told that normally the skills of an assassin are primarily offensive in nature, as they have little need for defense defending themselves, but Rei's lightning spirit style was known for its adaptability. We can see this when Rei changes his fighting style and begins landing devastating blows on Saw, but to his surprise, the Burmese fighter is able to tank it quite easily with little to no damage. Kao Lan remarks that even though Rei's attacks had a deadly precision behind them, they were far too weak to damage Saw Ping effectively. As the battle rages on, Saw finally goes on the offensive by fainting with his knee and instead grabbing Rei and delivering his trademark headbutt. Things are, however, far from over, as Ray had managed to make a last minute adjustment by slamming his forehead, the hardest part of his skull, under Saw's jaw. The shock from this blow severely rattled both fighters, but surprisingly, it was Saw who came off worse for the wear. Ray seeks to capitalize on this and begins a fresh barrage of blows, but Saw manages to close the distance between them and fires off his own barrage of leg kicks, severely injuring Ray's legs. As the fight draws to a climax, both fighters approach each other to deliver the final blow. When the dust settles though, it's Ray who comes out the victor, as he had been just ever so slightly faster and connected with a punch on Saw's chin. Although victorious, he remarks that he had grossly overestimated his own strength and had never imagined facing an opponent who would be able to take so many of his strikes. Stating that he needs to step up his game and hone his skill further, he exits the arena. Kao Lan steps up to Saw after the battle and tries to advise him on the critical parts of the fight. He encourages Saw Ping to continue honing his own skills further, but Saw, who is dejected after a fresh loss, apologizes and says that he's giving up. Seeing this broken side of Saw Ping, Kao Lan momentarily loses his cool and shouts at the young fighter before walking away disappointed. This episode was based on a good old 1v1 brawl between two fighters of opposite styles. Even though Saw Ping initially comes off as an obnoxiously loud character, he grows on the audience by the end of the episode. 
We find out the true reason behind his need to fight in the tournament, and the audience is left with the feeling that this Myanmar-based fighter is able to rise up from the loss. Episode 6, An Old Friend. The episode opens with Hayama Katsumasa's guardians questioning his decisions due to more of his fighters failing in the tournament. They realize that they only have one more fighter left to do their bidding. Long Min, however, comforts the guardians, telling them not to stress because no matter what, it would be them that will be coming out on top at the end of the tournament. Sayaka then announces that the next fighters are Setsuna Kiryu and Kuroki Gensai. Before the battle begins, Kuroki Gensai asks Setsuna about his solitary shadow style technique as it originally belonged to his friend Genzan. His friend had been murdered by one of his own disciples and he asks Kiryu if it was in fact he who murdered Kuroki's friend and his own master. Kiryu chooses to ignore his question and launches into an attack. Kuroki uses the cat stance and Kiryu retaliates by using the blink to disappear technique. This is easily countered by Kuroki as he's used to fighting against the solitary shadow strike technique. The scene then shifts to a flashback of Kuroki and his close friend Genzin discussing the history of the solitary shadow strike technique. We learn that many of the practitioners of the technique had perished after a war, but he had taken a new student under his wing and was currently working on adding new moves to his style in order to challenge his friend Kuroki. The episode snaps back to the present as Kiryu attacks Kuroki with a flurry of powerful attacks and blows, but to no avail. The veteran fighter seems to be unfazed and hardly affected by Kiryu's tactics. As the battle rages on, we're thrown back in time for another flashback. We finally get to see Setsuna's tragic and traumatic past, how he had been created by a wealthy father by paying a prostitute to be a surrogate mother in order for the boy to be used to replace his failing organs. After the death of his mother, Kiryu believed that he deserved to die, but on the day that the goons were meant to come and collect his organs, Kiryu would step in between them and rescue him. This was the start of his unhealthy obsession with our protagonist as Kiryu began to view Oma as a god. Upon following Oma, he saw Niko training him in the art of Niko style. However, seeing Oma being trained so harshly, he vows vengeance on Niko for hurting his god. Kiryu would then go on to meet Ginza, and after proving his determination to the latter, he would begin training under his new master. He would show his prodigious talent by being able to mimic the blink to disappear technique within minutes of seeing it for the first time by merely retracing Ginza's steps. After mastering all the techniques of the solitary shadow strike school, he would kill his master and disappear. This episode gave us an interesting clash of techniques and principles between Kiryu and Kuroki, where one is wild and psychotic, the other is steady and calm. By giving us Setsuna's traumatic background, it finally granted the audience insight into his unhealthy obsession with Oma, which we have seen from the start of the series. The stakes for the current battle are also raised when we find out Setsuna's former master was Kuroki's best friend. The fight is set to continue in the next episode, and is sure to deliver on the hype now that we know the caliber of both the fighters and the stakes at hand. Episode 7, Hell. The seventh episode, titled Hell, continues the fight between Kiryu and Kuroki as the battle reaches its zenith. The two warriors continue to deal devastating blows to each other with neither coming out on top. The stalemate, however, doesn't last long as Kuroki manages to block Kiryu's Rakshasa palm technique from a close distance and manages to overwhelm the young fighter with his very own signature move called the Devil's Lance. Using this technique, Kuroki managed to land a fatal blow on Kiryu's chest. The fight ends and Kuroki is declared the victor. However, he expresses curiosity about how Kiryu managed to survive the supposedly fatal blow. We find out that Kiryu had managed to use his own Rakshasa's palm on himself at the nick of time and managed to displace his heart just enough for the Devil's Lance to miss the vital organ. Oma is still decommissioned due to his injury as the next stage of matches is announced, with Hatsumi Sen set to take the stage. Everyone's taken aback, however, when his opponent is announced to be Yohei Bando, who had lost his life during his battle with Hanafusa Hajime, but is seen as having been miraculously revived. Episode 8, Resurrection. The episode begins with Bando's resurrection being confirmed to be Hei Chachi and Furumi Pharma's doing. We find out from Takeshi that despite Hatsumi's inconsistencies, he's an extremely skilled fighter. In fact, he was one of only two people ever to make Takeshi surrender. The battle begins in earnest between Sen, who has a much more measured and cunning approach, and Bando, whose style translates to raw, overwhelming power. As the two fighters display extraordinary skills, they continue to awe the audience, trading blow for blow. In the end, however, Hatsumi manages to crack the code regarding Bando's deadly arm technique and overwhelms him in brutal fashion. The match concludes with Bando taking a fatal hit, but once again surviving, defying all logic. The two show mutual respect as the match concludes. The episode ends with Kazuo standing over the body of Oma, who is still unconscious even as the battle draw nears. Kazuo claims that they would be retiring from the competition as the curtain closes on the episode. 
This one's pretty straightforward with some heart-pounding action uninterrupted by flashbacks and other things. It does a great job of retaining audience interest by ending on a cliffhanger. Episode 9, Superiority. This episode finally sees the much-anticipated debut of Kaolong Wansawat, also known as the Thai God of War, against the formidable fang of Matsuda, Kano Agito. Both fighters initially fight with the same technique, but after a while, Kao Long's superiority becomes evident. He slow seals all of Kano's techniques, making the fighter increasingly frustrated and angry. Kano finally resorts to a secret technique very similar to Sistema, a Russian martial art that focuses on flexible movements and a relaxed stance. While he does begin to gain some ground back, Kao Long easily once again adapts to this new technique and starts brutally punishing him. The episode ends with Kano challenging Kao Long to start using Muay Thai against him. Just like the title of this episode suggests, it's about Kao Long establishing his superiority over his opponent, Kano. Episode 10, Life and Death. With the 10th episode of the series, the battle between Kao Long and the Fang finally comes to its conclusion. Fang manages to outlast Kao Long's onslaught despite appearing to be on the ropes in the last episode. With some clever use of tactics and taking advantage of his opponent's fatigue from continuously striking, Kano manages to land a decisive kick on Kao Long's head, knocking him out cold. Despite his victory, Fang isn't pleased with himself, remarking that he hadn't been able to finish the fight like he envisioned since he had lost completely in the striking department. Later in the day, as everyone engaged themselves at a party, Hayami's men swarmed the venue and held all of the executive members present hostage. Hayami announces that he is initiating a coup d'etat demanding the support of the executive members and forming a new Kengen Association with him on top as its chairman. Episode 11, Rebel Flag. This episode continues the coup d'etat initiated by Hayami Katsumasa as he continues to threaten the executives with either complying with his demands or perishing. Hayami tells them that he had rigged the entire place with explosives and in the events his demands weren't met, he would trigger the explosives, killing everyone, including the fighters. The fighters are also cornered off one by one in their respective rooms and are made aware of the situation. We get to see Oma's dreaming about his training days with Nico. We follow his memories through a seven day training course in the jungle with his mentor as he recalls the brutal nature of his training. Despite being unconscious, we are finally given a fight scene involving Oma after what seems like an age. In the real world, the executive members refuse to relent to Hayami's demands and begin to retaliate. Iryo Kure, the patriarch of the Kure family, laughs as he tells us that he had known about the coup all along as about 100 members of his family descend into the fray. Episode 12, Melee. Pandemonium breaks out as Hayami's group starts fighting against the other factions in earnest. Oma wakes up in the nick of time and prevents Kazuo from getting killed by Ranjo. Oma knocks him out with a single strike, showing that despite his being comatose for most of the series, he still retains his edge. We're shown that somehow, his flashbacks during his time unconscious helped Oma come out of his slumber and become even stronger. Hayami's coup is easily tackled as the bombs that he had set up refused to detonate after they had been defused by the Sirius gang. The coup, however, seems to have just been a ruse to camouflage a much deeper plot. Despite looking sharper, Oma is seen coughing blood as he walks towards the fight and says that he hopes he has what it takes to last three more rounds. End of Season 2 explained and expectation for Part 2 of Season 2. Season 2 ends with questions regarding Oma's health still being unanswered. Despite him appearing refreshed and sharper than ever due to the training in his subconscious, he was shown hiding a deeper underlying injury. This perhaps has to do with the condition of his heart that the doctor mentioned earlier in the season. In the upcoming season, it'll be interesting to see how our hero is able to overcome his failing health, come out on top, and gain answers to the various questions he has. Whatever the case, we're sure Oma will not come out unscathed by the time the final battle is over. The coup d'etat also fizzles out relatively quickly despite having been built up and hinted at throughout the second season. It's hard to believe that what we saw in the end was all there was to it. Many speculate that Hayami's ousting was not a good thing for the Japanese economy as he held a major position in it. Nogi Hideki is confronted by Oma, who asks him to tell the truth, but the CEO of the Nogi group plays dumb. Oma shrugs and tells him he'll find out after the remaining three matches. It's therefore confirmed that Nogi has a major role to play in whatever the coup was covering up. Due to this, we we also pretty much know that there's a greater conspiracy at work, which we will probably encounter in the new set of episodes. All of these factors, from Oma's uncertain fate to the conspiracy surrounding the world of Kengen, are sure to come to a head as the season finally draws to a conclusion. We cannot wait to see how these events will unfold. Will Oma defy fate and stand on top as the greatest fighter to ever exist? And will the association that's been in place since the Edo period finally crumble against the conspiracies looming on the horizon? 
Kengen Omega. Well, it's been confirmed that there will be no official Kengen Ashura Season 3, a spin-off called Kengen Omega is in the works. It will, of course, be set in the same world and might even feature some familiar faces. The protagonist is, however, said to be someone different than Oma. We do know that it's set two years after the events of the Kengen Annihilation Tournament on Ganryu Island, and it's set to follow the journey of Narushima Koga, who is searching for Oma for undisclosed reasons. Looming on the horizon is a massive showdown between the Kengen Association and Purgatory, another underground martial arts organization, and lines are going to be drawn in the sand as titans of the fighting world clash once again with new stakes. Narushima Koga seeks to prove himself worthy of entering this tournament in search of Oma and his own destiny. Marvelous Verdict! The future of martial arts anime has never looked brighter and more secure. We are sure there are millions around the globe salivating to dive into this new offering from the Kengen world. As the bodies hit the floor and victorious warriors rise above their fallen foes, the world will quake under the power of their fists. We are just so excited to go on this final ride to discover the fate of Tokita Oma and the world of Kengen itself. As conspiracies unfurl and crumble and blood is shed on the sands of the arena, we wait to find out, along with you, whether Tokita will survive his ordeal and finally find peace and what will be the fate of Kazuo, the humble salary man. For now though, we're at the end of this video and we hope we've been able to jog your memory about the past episodes along with adding some tantalizing theories about what to expect next. This is Wheezy249 signing off, but you can always find me on Twitch. Thanks for watching, stay safe out there and have a marvelous day.